There's a big election coming up in 2020, and I don't mean the one in the United States. The people of Taiwan, the island formerly named the Republic of China, a nation that is not a nation, is gearing up for presidential elections on January 11, 2020. And I want to talk a little bit about it. So let's start with some background history. For a long time, the Kuomintang Party ruled China proper. Founded by Sun Yat-sen and then led by Chiang Kai-shek, the party led China to victory against the Japanese, but lost to Mao Zedong and the Communist Party of China. But before the Communists could annihilate the Kuomintang for good, the party and over one million Chinese retreated to the island of Taiwan. The island had been recently ceded back to the Chinese government from the Japanese after World War II. There, the Kuomintang leadership took power, suppressed all dissent, and imposed martial law. Bad things happened. But a confluence of events conspired to cause the Kuomintang to cede their political monopoly. Over 30 years ago, Chiang Kai-shek's son, Zhan Jingguo, died and the Republic of China became a democracy. The people can now go to the polls and choose their national leaders. A new opposition party officially coalesced, comprising of those seeking to break Kuomintang monopoly rule, the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP. Zhan Jingguo's hand-picked successor was Li Donghui a native Taiwanese, meaning that he comes from the Han Chinese population born on the island as opposed to those who recently arrived there as refugees from the mainland. He handily won re-election to the presidency in 1996 with the help of the Communist Party firing a few missiles in the Taiwan Strait. But after Li Donghui stepped down from the presidency, the DPP took advantage of the Kuomintang not coalescing around a coherent successor and elected Chen Sui-bian to the presidency. The handover of power from one party to another is historic, but President Chen's Administration saw charges of corruption, deep tensions with both the U.S. and China over his pro-independence stances, and finally an inability to pass laws due to the Kuomintang maintaining a hold on, the Taiwan, on Taiwan's legislative branches. President Chen stepped down due to term limits in 2008, but afterwards was prosecuted for corruption. The DPP hit rock bottom, and the people of Taiwan elected Kuomintang candidate Ma Ying-jeou. President Ma would barely win re-election in 2012 over the DPP candidate Party Chairwoman Tsai Ing-wen, 52% to 46%. President Ma came to power behind the promise of revitalizing Taiwan's flagging economy. The communists reciprocated, and many new economic integrations opened up. Direct flights between China and Taiwan, a tsunami of Chinese tourists, uh, new free trade deals, and topped off with a beautiful ceremony between the Taiwanese and Chinese presidents in November 2015. Warm and beautiful, the Ma's economic policies had troubling consequences. The free trade deals Ma signed with China benefited economic elites who shifted their investments away from the island to the mainland. The result is widening economic inequality. The rich got much richer while others foundered. For an especially egalitarian population, Taiwan ranks 111th in income inequality on par with Canada, Poland, Italy, and ahead of Japan and the US. This caused deep tensions. Tens of thousands of Taiwanese immigrated to the mainland, taking advantage of China's economic opportunities. It is said that up to 10% of Taiwan's best and brightest work on the mainland. Young people left with a stagnant economy struck back. One particular trade agreement sparked the Sunflower Movement, occupying the Taiwanese legislature and forcing the administration to back away from any further moves to bind Taiwan and China together economically. By the end of his presidency, Ma was so toxic that the Kuomintang candidate for 2016 did not look to him for help. Tsai was elected to power with a commanding majority, 56% of the vote, while the Kuomintang fielded 31% and a third party with 12%. The electoral outcome was so certain that it was hardly a news item. Taiwanese working on the mainland did not bother coming home to vote, plunging voter turnout to a record low. Critically, this had far-reaching legislative effects. They say that legislative party members depend on turnout from the headlining presidential candidate to help get them elected. So, uh, the Kuomintang saw its legislative ma majorities annihilated. This meant that Tsai came to power with the ability to propose and pass legislation. Such a thing has never happened before in Taiwanese history. But Tsai stumbled, and her popularity dropped on a number of unpopular domestic moves. Some of them are not our fault. Some totally are. First, the obvious thing. The Chinese threw a fit. They saw President Tsai as someone they did not want to engage with and withheld many of the economic goodies they gave to the Kuomintang. To them, this is rather fair as the DPP party charter explicitly seeks Taiwan independence. President Chen of the DPP gave them fits over a decade earlier. Tsai pledged to maintain the status quo, but China threw a hissy fit anyway. Namely, they, uh, they stopped sending the tourists. Oh no, 
not the tourists. They also took a number of Taiwan's few remaining diplomatic allies, like El Salvador. Okay, so that is China. But there are a few actual serious issues that hit Thai hard. A number of power outages in major population areas cause huge problems, resulting in the resignation of one cabinet member. For those not living here, this whole place depends on air conditioning. It gets brutal here during the summer when the power is out. Pension reform legislation cutting the pensions paid to various retired military and government workers probably necessary due to the relatively low retirement age, iffy government budgets, and generous pension benefits, definitely did not endear her to a very engaged group of voters. And then there is a new labor law that changes the working hours. For a place where a lot of young people spend long hours on the job, this seems really counterintuitive. I don't think it's necessary to make them work even more. The end result of these boneheaded initiatives is a drubbing in the 2018 midterm elections and the emergence of Guomidan challenger Han Guoyu. Han Guoyu is the Taiwanese son of two parents from Henan. He served three terms as a legislator in Taiwan's equivalent of Congress. Nothing special about that. In 2017, he contested for the Guomindang Party chairmanship and got 5% of the votes, finishing in fourth place. But in 2018, he won the mayorship of Kaohsiung, a city that had been DPP stronghold for decades. He ran with little party support and ran on the concept of economic development. Kaohsiung for several decades had been the industrial heart of Taiwan, but the changing economy has left it with an economic downturn and the vast majority of its workers moving to northern Taiwan or the mainland. Han Guoyu essentially ran on the concept of Kaohsiung becoming rich, with very little detail about how this might actually happen. He simply said that what he would deal with it once he was in office. This vague economic promise persuaded a desperate population of former DPP supporters looking for change of any kind to switch sides. He won and sparked a Han Guoyu frenzy. His supporters, for some reason, really love the guy. It's pretty Trumpian. Han then set his sights for the presidency. Seems a bit hasty to me, considering he worked the Kaohsiung mayorship for like three months. But okay, whatever floats your boat. He beat Foxconn founder Terry Goh, who started running because the sea god Matsu told him to, but then backed off after his real god showing his, showing his displeasure for his policies. For the Guomindan candidacy to face... Uh, incumbent President Tai, has before he's running on a campaign of economic revival and change. Okay, so you know the uh, the big players now. So, how are Taiwan's elections different or similar to those in America's, which I presume make up the majority of my viewers? Like with America, people go to a voting station to go vote. Unlike with America, people must go back to their place of house registration in order to go vote. So if you were born in the southern city of Tainan and are registered there, then you work, vote there. Even if you work and have worked in Taipei for years, you need to go back to your place of origin. This is the same case for Taiwanese living abroad, including the mainland. So there are ironic situations where the Chinese mainlanders would encourage their Taiwanese workers to return to Taiwan to vote, presuming that those Taiwanese would vote more pro-mainland. The candidate with the plurality of voters wins. There is no electoral college, meaning that you do not have candidates pandering to the Taiwanese equivalent of Florida and Ohio. The candidate with the most votes from the 23 million people of Taiwan wins. That is it. So what's uh, what's going to happen? You know, my best guess? The polls right now as I make this show Han trailing pretty far behind Tai. Unlike I said earlier, Unlike with the United States, you will not have a situation where Han might win a lot of votes in some remote area of Taiwan and thus win the presidency with a minority. Han needs more votes to beat Tsai. Polls say he does not have those votes. But Taiwanese electoral politics do not skew along the same political divides that we in America are familiar with. For one thing, the electorate is not as so solidified along party lines as they are in the United States. Yeah, there are two big parties, but there is a very large contingent of voters who don't care for either party and think they are both trash. They tend to vote for the best candidate, which is how you get someone like the current Taipei mayor, Ko wen an independent who associates with neither party, and that guy's actually worth a video in the future. So candidate matters. Tai for a while did not set people's hearts on fire, but she is definitely more popular than Han, especially amongst younger people. If you are in your 30s or younger, you probably don't like Han. I can't quite put my finger on it as to why. My best guess is that he kind of stands for a lot of the empty-headedness and talk without substance that make Trump's that makes Trump so unpopular with American educated voters. But Tai, like I said, has her flaws. 
But in recent years, or days, she's endeared herself more to the younger and more progressive voters with a tough vote on the gay marriage issue, a vote taken in defiance of a recent public referendum, which is super impressive in my opinion, and her public opposition of a recent Xi Jinping speech advocating the Communist Party's official policy of one country, two systems for Taiwan. And yes, you have the China factor. China favors the Kuomintang party in power as the Kuomintang nominally supports closer ties to the mainland. The CPC created one country, two systems policy specifically for Taiwan, at the time aware that the island, like Hong Kong, was governed by an autocratic single party that can deliver it the island without hassle. Xi Dada, however, either neglected to remember just how popular the policy is in Taiwan, or just didn't care, and is now even less popular after the 29 Hong 2019 Hong Kong protests broke out. There is a saying that Taiwan midterms and local elections tend to be about the milk and potato issues that most ordinary people care about, but the national elections are about the country's relationship with China. If that's the case, then it appears that the Kuomintang has a tough task ahead of it because China has been in the news a whole lot lately, and in not a good way. So, you know, end conclusion? Who knows? I cannot vote here, so basically all I can do is sit and watch and get some popcorn for what happens. For those still interested in this kind of thing, I would recommend the Frozen Garlic blog, which is an English blog on Taiwanese elections and politics. It's written by an American professor, and it's a great resource. All right, elections are January 11th. Look forward to seeing you all and uh, seeing what's going to happen. All right, have a good one. Bye-bye.